Today's episode is a big one. We break down a little bit of news, but the important thing in top 10 tips and tricks for your fantasy football league, keeping it fresh, getting those new ideas, new ways to think. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. Leave us a comment on your tips and tricks for this fantasy football season. Enjoy the show. Foot Clan, the fantasy football season, it's upon us. Drafts are about to happen, and hopefully you are wise. And you have the ultimate draft kit, the number one tool to get you ready for those drafts, sleepers, breakouts, bus values, all of our point projections. Lots more in the draft kit, including the UDK Plus, which has the draft analyzer. We will grade your team. We will tell you your strengths and weaknesses. We will help equip you to be strong and mighty in your leagues. And we're very excited to once again be partnering with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital this season uh, as they work to help end childhood cancer and ensure families never receive a bill from St. Jude. One dollar of every UDK sold will go directly to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital to support its mission in finding cures and saving children. Check it all out at ultimatedraftkit.com. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Oh my gosh. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. That's what it's like, Andy. <laughs> I I feel like I'm smoother. Oh, you are smoother. He was a little I was uh, like a, he was a, a little growly. Was like a lawnmower. You're a little bit country. <laughs> I'm a lot of bit rock and roll. <laughs> Is that what that was? That was the rock and roll intro. Yeah. I was not expecting that. Ah! Well, now that, <laughs> that I can get behind. Welcome into the Fantasy Footballers. Friday, August 12th. Uh, still, uh, there's still a, a wait for the voice to return. So thank you for handle, handling it, now. Mike. Yeah. APB, that's what I was going to say. There's an <laughs> APB out for the voice. Uh, but I appreciate it, Mr. Wright. Top 10 tips and tricks on the show today. Jason Moore is here. How you uh, doing? I'm very excited. This is always one of the big shows of the year and, and it is also a very difficult show because <laughs> at this point yes <laughs> we have been doing this a long time and we try our darndest to give you really actionable tips that are going to help you that aren't just regurgitations from every year prior Dra you know there's so much stuff you can go back and listen to these episodes every single year and they they hold up very well we have a book we do have a book <laughs> we have a book full of them that's right. I forgot that we have a book. <laughs> you forgot that you're a, a best-selling author? That's right. Uh, we have 10 more for you today. And uh, very excited to share them with you. The nice thing, Jason, is that while they do hold up year over year, fantasy football does evolve and things change. Yes, it does. And, and, and so we adjust with the times. We're uh, very hip. Very, very hip. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> at, least, Brooks, at least two thirds. Brooks, do you agree that we are very hip? Yeah, that's how you know you're very hip when you yeah. say when you it. say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I mean, you can just hear it, right? Established. Yeah, Al Borland in the building. How you doing, Al? I'm great. Yeah. What's up, Foot Clan? Oh, that's nice. That was very Someone friendly. had coffee this <laughs> morning. He's getting. No, he's crushing a protein shake right now. Oh, is he he's growing down? Did you do some push-ups. He's or getting something? swole. That's right. In swole land. <laughs> so, it's, and it's just a shake it's not a protein <laughs> shake so he didn't do uh, any workout he's just like i want the uh, it's ice cream <laughs> <laughs> a morning ice cream shake for al uh let's jump into the news news and notes from around the league this ah. is this is uh number one podcast sports podcast uh kind of Material. Yes. Here, here at the top of the show. Uh, oh, okay. G yeah, give me that sound effect again. Gah, my groin. Uh, Rashad Penny. <laughs> groin injury. Suffered in practice this week. They're calling it minor, and that's great. I mean, you want to hear that this isn't something to be concerned about. There's still a month before the season kicks off. However, this is a problem for two reasons. One is history. We have not seen Rashad Penny be able to uh, stay healthy forever. And also... He dealt with 
an issue. I, I, you know, a couple of weeks ago he was uh, had a minor injury. Whenever you have this minor injury and you take some time off and you come back and you re-aggravate something, it is very, very worrisome. And it's never more worrisome than when you draft a high-level replacement that is playing behind you. And I'm sure Ken Walker will start shooting up ADPs with uh, this Rashad Penny groin injury if it keeps him out any length of time in the preseason. And Walker getting, you know, Pete Carroll, a.k.a. Peach Cobbler, he is one who likes to put out the hype train pieces, really, you know, uh, stand for his guys when it comes to the media. Having said that, but though Ken Walker, he is getting a lot of praise from head coach Carroll. I think the last one was just he was – you know, uh, quote, surprised at how well-rounded Walker is. You know, a just a nod to the the pass catching ability of Walker of like that he didn't get to showcase in college. Seemed like he had the ability in the uh, at the combine doing the drills. So it, I mean, this is he is I'm, a good. I'm, I'm I'm getting into Walker, man. Walker's a good pass catcher, and I, we we shared this a little bit in the uh, pre NFL draft time. He 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 does not have any college production of receiving. That wasn't how he was used. He's good at it. You go watch his high school film. He was absolutely electric. He didn't forget how to catch the ball. You're you're digging into the archives of his I high wanted, school I, film. I, 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 when it's off film season, film grinder when Jason it, Moore. When it's off season, you have a lot more time on your hands, <laughs> and so. that's uh, that's the physical, like the film reel. Yes. Oh, absolutely. You got to put them in the projector. Were, yeah, I mean, that's I got like a couple on VHS, <laughs> um, but most of them, you're right, were the eight reels. millimeter. Yeah. yeah, did you get a laser disc in there? <laughs> Too fancy, Mike. <laughs> Too fancy for his film work. Um, yeah, I mean, right now, Ken Walker is being drafted. Ahead of Rashad Penny. Yeah. For the promise and the hopes and the dreams. And there was a time this offseason I thought Penny was a great value. Yes, we all did. Uh, but now I'm shaking in my boots. All right, here we go. The Lions believe wholeheartedly in a 1-2 Ooh. running back approach with DeAndre Swift and Jamal Williams. Um, this is a quote from an ESPN article by Jeremy Fowler. And he also said this is not what fantasy managers want to hear. I think we just did the running back rankings episode. DeAndre Swift was not as high as, as he is for some people in our rankings because of concerns here. It's been a million years since a Detroit Lions running back has been, dare I say, trustworthy in fantasy, right? I, I mentioned Theo Riddick with Matthew Stafford. I think he hit the 80 reception mark one year or a couple of years, and that was that was fine. But it's hard to trust a Lions running back to, to be consistent and and be a player that moves into that upper echelon week over week. But yeah. when, is, when is the last time the Lions had a head coach that could rep 225? Oh, good question, Mike. Never. Yeah, probably never. And it's ironic because Amir Abdullah oh, making oh, some news oh, news today as the, oh. as the third down back in Las Vegas. I knew it! Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's wow. your time to shine, Mike. <laughs> Carrion Johnson's going to be signed <laughs> any minute to one of these teams. Hey, at least my guy's on a team. Yeah. But, I, but you should, I mean, look, I, I'm not saying – like, DeAndre Swift has his entire future ahead of him to prove what he is and isn't. This is not a Barry DeAndre Swift. He's going to be amazing. He's one of the best pass catchers in football. This is just saying, like, the equal amount of excitement for Amir Abdullah and, and Carrion Johnson were there. There was the equal amount of excitement for both players. Yeah, I, I would say that's true, but the profile of DeAndre Swift to catch the ball, and I mean, he, he's an injury risk for sure. Uh, what running back isn't? That being said, I don't worry about this Jamal Williams news. I never had DeAndre Swift getting 75% of the carries. Like, that's, that's not the type of player that he is. And if you look at his splits with and without Jamal Williams, it's 0 0.2 points different. Yeah. He when he was the running back eleven last year at the beginning of the year the through the first uh, or he was the running back nine through the first eleven weeks the vast majority of those games Jamal Williams played in and this was the same coaching staff I, this is a report that is saying what we already knew but because it's said right now we're like <gasps> what Jamal Williams is going to be used like yes it and that's already, fine it's already baked into our projection yeah absolutely I I think DeAndre Swift is a is an excellent draft pick in the second round. Uh, which is also where Amir Abdullah and Kerryon Johnson were drafted. Second round running backs for Detroit. Once upon Swift time. actually has already done something, though. Absolutely. The Browns will consider acquiring Jimmy Garoppolo <laughs> if Deshaun Watson's six-game suspension is significantly increased. Which uh, seems likely. Well, it, it 
seems like that is a, a strong possibility. And I'm curious. Uh, we're, we're recording this Friday morning. We haven't heard anything. But the the Browns did announce yesterday or the day before that Watson's going to start preseason game one. I don't know if this is a, uh, a ploy by the Cleveland Browns to say NFL, let's go. Like, we need to know what's going on with our team. We need to know who to prepare for week one and so that hopefully we can get that suspension news. It's Friday, too. This is the NFL's favorite time of the week to do a dump when it comes to bad news. Well, as you say, it, the NFL should give two farts about whether or not they're fast enough for Cleveland. But I'm saying, like, if you put Watson on the field, in, like, on, uh, on a televised game, like, uh, that's, a, that's a little bit more shocking when, when you have all the things floating around him than just him at practice. All right. Uh, we did have some preseason football last night. Uh, Traylon Burks played into the fourth quarter. Robert Woods and Nick Westbrook-Akine uh, rested with the starters. Fourth wide receiver to enter the game, one target. I have I've seen everything on Traylon Burks this offseason. Yeah. I've seen the – uh, extremes by way of pessimism, and then I have seen the defenders come mighty with swords and shields to say Traylon Burks is fine, and, and I got a text yesterday saying, oh, he's playing with the ones. And then uh, goes out there, obviously, and, and got rookie treatment last night. But the potential for Traylon Burks is still there. It's just a question for fantasy players. What draft pick do you spend on him, and then when do you think you can count on him? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to overreact to these news. You said the rookie treatment. He's a rookie. He's getting more reps. They're worried about his uh, conditioning, like play him through the game. That that makes sense. He's not doing well. The news has been negative throughout. Uh, the majority of news has been negative throughout, you know, from uh, rookie minicamp through till last night. But you don't want to overreact to this. I mean, there's – Justin Jefferson wasn't a starter – in the beginning, remember he yeah. he he was he was running behind, and then and then it wasn't uh, you know he wasn't even a starter week one and week two. I'm not calling him Justin Jefferson here. I'm saying right. that um, you you don't you don't want to overreact to this news. Here's what we know: we know he was the 18th pick in the NFL draft. We know they traded AJ Brown and that they desperately need him. Whether or not he could step to the plate or not, I'm trying to not overreact in either direction. I don't want to say I don't want to ignore the negative news, but I think that when we take some of this and just take him off our boards and say, well, Burks is done. He's never going to be a thing. Like He hasn't played a, a, a real snap of NFL football yet. I'm going to go with the historical data of these first-round wide receivers thrust into a position where he's probably going to be starting very soon. As far as where I draft him... Uh, he's going in like the top of the eighth right now. Yeah, that's... Young that's that feels a little high for me okay. in a redraft league because I don't think he gets off to a really strong start. So if I can get him in the double-digit rounds and hold him for a while, that's that's more the plan. All right. Any other news, Brooks, that uh, you have your eyes on? Nope. All right. Let's get to it. Tips and tricks. All right, we are kicking off our top 10 tips and tricks to help you win your league right now. Number 10. We call this map it out. Ooh, map it out, huh? Make a map. Okay? <laughs> you are the map for your draft. Map uh, found the map. <laughs> oh, the yeah. Map. <laughs> oh, don't you dare bring Dora the Explorer into this. For those I'm of you that map. didn't have children. I'm a map. Oh, that's the worst. But that does drive map the point. Map it out. That does drive the point home that you are the map. And I don't want you to forget this at your fantasy football drafts. So we did bring in a friend from Door of the Explorer. It's me. I'm the map. I'm oh, no. I'm the map. I'm the map. I'm yes. The map. I'm the map. I'm the map. I'm we ruined the, the joke. I'm the map. I'm the map. Wow. The map. You guys helped the joke. That, do you realize how long that goes? If you <laughs> didn't have children and have, were subjected to having to watch that stupid, awful show... That is the worst character next to Caillou of all time. Why does he say just the same three words over and over that long? He, it's a map, Jason. Like, how articulate do you expect a piece of paper to be? Okay, that's fair. That's a good count. <laughs> I just wanted it one time. I'm the map. We get it. 
Anyways. I mean, Dora yells everything ar- already, right? Yeah, yeah it's oh. me, Dora. Let's go Every- new things. Everyone screams on that show. So, anyways. We would never do that. No, no. Goodness. Um, I was more of a Franklin guy. <laughs> so, let's talk about this map. Here's what mapping it out means. Um, this is something I personally do. This is something that every fantasy manager should do. They, you want to be resilient. You want to be able to know when things go certain directions. So you're at the top of the draft. You're at the back of the draft. And a player falls to you. What happens if you take a running back or versus a wide receiver versus a tight end? What do you like later in the draft? So what I recommend doing, and I'm going to give you my personal example of what I have done on, uh, I've been drafting a lot on underdogs, so this is where that ADP is from. You need to do this for your platform. If you're playing on Sleeper, look at their ADP. If you're playing on ESPN, use their ADP. If Yahoo, use theirs. But you just go round by round, pull up their ADP. This will take you maybe five, ten minutes at the most. Write the rounds down, and then just round by round, write out per position how many guys you like or love or hate or whatever. So here's mine. I don't really worry about the first two rounds. The first two rounds, I like all the wide receivers and running backs. There's some I like more than others. I'm not taking a quarterback or a tight end. In round three on underdog, there are three running backs I like, seven wide receivers I like, no quarterbacks or tight ends. In round four, there are three running backs I like, five wide receivers I like. So those are fairly even, but I know that I prefer – the wide receivers currently at their ADP in rounds three and four to the running backs by a slight margin. But then this was really, this revealed a lot to me after doing this exercise, after mapping it out. I found that in round five, there was zero running backs that I liked at ADP and four wide receivers I liked. In round six, only one running back I liked at ADP in round six, three wide receivers I liked. And in round seven, there were zero running backs I liked at ADP and four wide receivers. So those three rounds, after I did this process, I looked. Not only that, there's six quarterbacks I love in rounds five, six, and seven. So I know going into my draft that when I get to rounds five, six, and seven, there is one running back I like, A.J. Dillon, six great quarterbacks, and tons of wide receivers, 11 wide receivers. So if I end up wide receiver heavy in my first three rounds, and I feel like I need to take running backs in this range later, I'm kind of screwing myself. Now, you might literally love the running backs in that round. You go and you look. You make the map. map. You're the map, and you might like them. You are the map. You are the map. You are the map. You're the map. You're the map. And then then it actually flipped for me. Eight, nine, and ten, I actually had 11 running backs that I like at ADP in those rounds. I like some of these late-round guys and not as many wide receivers. It changes from platform to platform. Look at your ADP. Just write this down before you go in the draft so that you know where to go at the end of your draft when you're at the beginning of your draft. It will make a massive change for you. Um, I know it has for me, and everybody that does this ends up with a roster they like much better at the end of their draft. You should consider tweeting your map. Sure. I will Just tweet to my show map how out. you put it together. And, uh, it seems like this is, in some ways, a tilt protective map because if things go a little different than you expect, you still have a plan, right? Mm-hmm. And this plan is pliable. It can move, but you know what's happening round by round. Fair enough. I love it. Yeah. And then we're done with the map thing, right? I will Never. only hit that drop one more time this episode. Great. Number nine. All right, this one uh, I'm going to call Master of Trades, Life of a Salesman. Okay, and it's going to be some general principles to apply to your trading life in your league. Uh, One of the things that we have mentioned in the past that I want to reiterate here is that you want the best player coming back in a trade. One of my most successful trade techniques, I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's the two for one, three for one, overwhelm your uh, trade partner with volume. I want the quality coming back. And part of the reason of that is that it is not really a two for one or three for one trade for your team. You are trading for the opportunity to use your skills to acquire waiver wire pickups on the back half of that trade. So if you send three away and you get the best player coming back, congratulations, you now get to go to market. You get to go find players on the waiver wire that you know, hopefully through just your ability 
and listening to the show, listening to the show and doing the things that you know you're supposed to do as a good fantasy player, you may be able to find comparable players on the waiver wire. So step one is I love overwhelming my opponent two for one, three for one deals. You get to put your skills to use. Um, the other thing that we want to remind you about is you can trade for players or trade players away when their production is unsustainable. Uh, players go out, they overperform. You know what the mean is, right? We talk about quarterback and their touchdown percentage. If somebody starts the year and they're, you know, they're on a Hall of Fame record-breaking pace for two or three weeks, that's an opportunity for you to cash in. And the reality is, is you aren't going to miss out if you do this correctly. If you get value coming back to you, the worst thing that can happen is is it's a break even. And if that player's uh, unsustainable production softens, you win that deal. When it comes to the salesman part of being a good trader, you know, you hear about meeting your opponent's needs. Sometimes you got to write the story for them. That's the salesman <laughs> sure. part. Sometimes you have to make the case to your opponent on why and what their story for their team is. And you have to be compelling and you have to be persistent and you have to be a salesman. Uh, one of the techniques that I take a lot of the time is helping to shape my opponent's opinions of my players. And I sometimes make an excuse for why I don't need them on my team anymore. That, you know, one of the ways I'll go, one of the different things I'll go to the well with is, uh, you know what? I'd love to keep this guy. I got too many of them on my team. Man, I'd love to keep this guy. I just got too many running backs. Um, you know, look, I'm kind of desperate right here. I don't want to do this trade, but I've got to fix this problem on my team. Maybe it fixes both our problems. Those are some of the kind of techniques that I would take in being uh, a liar persuasive. <laughs> I feel so hurt now remembering back all these trades we've made. Hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, I mean, look, I have no choice to do this deal. It helps both of us. If it helps both of us, whatever, man. This is a big league. Um, I'm backed into it. So there are ways to be persuasive. And, you know, that's the goal. Like, none of us are out there. And I know you guys will say maybe not the same thing that I'll say. I am not there to primarily meet the needs of my trade opponent. I'm there to meet my needs. We can pretend that the goal is to meet their needs too. It's not. I want to win the trade. That's what everybody out there wants to do. I, I love the moment when Jason is seething. Because he sees the trade come through and he's like, what What logical reason was there for this trade to happen? Well, that that is a product of being persuasive in, a, in an argument or in, in a trade discussion and framing the narrative. And that's what you have to do to win on these deals um, and not just be neutral. So master of trades, life of a salesman. Number eight. I'd like to kick off my number eight tip here with a, uh, a lyric from a great poet who once said, because what you see, you might not get. And we can bet, so don't you get souped yet. You're scheming on a thing, it's a mirage. I'm trying to tell you now. It's arbitrage! I may have changed the lyric in there. <laughs> oh my goodness, that was quite the setup, Mike. Wow. <laughs> because I want to talk about arbitrage. It is a very hot buzzword in fantasy football right now. And for a good reason. Uh, we in fantasy football we look at it a little bit different than uh, in the world of of finance. But as we all know, financials, stocks, there are some parallels, uh, quite a few parallels when it comes to fantasy football, and you can use some of those techniques. But what we are looking at in fantasy football is we're trying to capitalize on different prices in the market because in fantasy football drafts there are players with similar production profiles and opportunities, but the ADP is just so vastly different. So like let's take a look at at the wide receiver position. Position AJ Brown, DK Metcalf. I mean their story goes back all the way to college, same team, same draft, closely drafted together. They both got paid. But here's the thing, AJ Brown is going going in the early third while meanwhile DK Metcalf 21 picks later. Both players should be the number ones. They should see a similar target share. Do they get similar touchdowns? I mean, these are these are things, exercises that you need to go through. Uh, and part of this tip for me, when I'm thinking about this, is if I'm in multiple leagues, 
And I'm so sure that A.J. Brown, like this is the year. A.J. Brown's going to have a great year. I think A.J. Brown will be fantastic. But what if things just go slightly wrong for A.J. Brown? Meanwhile, D.K. Metcalf, who we're all so sure is going to have this season where he busts because of Geno Smith or Drew Locke, what if that goes just slightly better than I'm actually planning on? I need to be willing to shape my portfolio to keep the financial talk going. I need to be willing to shape it in a way where these guys are similar and there's a chance that they my, go the way like the my, other direction. Yeah, like my projection for these players could go a different way. Looking at the tight end position, TJ Hawkinson going in the middle of the sixth. Cole Komet from the Chicago Bears is going in the eleventh. These are very similar situations. Bad teams. Tight ends that profile to see a huge target share in their offense because there's not really established superstars on that team. Like you got Amon Ross St. Brown for the Lions. You got Darnell Mooney for the Chicago Bears. Like really similar. And, and look at just what they did this past year. Joe Burrow versus Kirk Cousins. 67 picks apart. Pocket passers. Outlier touchdown rates. Superstar wide receivers. I, I, I know that the youth is on Joe Burrow's side, so that's what we're betting on those things. But it's fantasy football, man. Things... Don't don't always go according to the plan. So be willing to think, get in that mentality of of the arbitrage. Like if so, it that's goes, taking advantage of of gaps bet yes. between similar players and and absolutely and viewing them not as player takes but as uh, player types. Yes, you say I want a pass catching running back on a on a good offense. Yeah, uh, you know so. Uh, uh, you, I want a a, a big bodied red zone threat yes. wide receiver, and and you look for the gaps there. Okay, makes sense. Let's take a quick break, and we'll be back with the rest of the list. What a quick break it was. Back with number seven. Back already. Number seven. All right, this tip goes out to all of the fantasy football managers who are very good at fantasy football and have not gotten over the hump. Good, not great. They've never won that championship. If you ain't first, you're last. If you ain't first, you're last. You know what I'm talking about? That phrase is trademark, not to use that permission to Ricky Bobby Inc. <laughs> Don't worry, I got Ricky Bobby's permission. Um, <laughs> look, this was a big problem for me for a long time. Uh, a long time ago, I never, I was too safe. I never wanted to take the risky pick because I didn't want to end up out of the playoffs and, uh, you know, dead last in my league shameful. if some of these guys yeah, shameful. shameful yeah um the reality was i was always very very good in these leagues but never great i wasn't one of those one or two juggernaut teams that no one wanted to go up against in the playoffs who usually one of those teams ends up winning the championship um this changed and i think it's one of the most important things that people need to realize is you need to be comfortable taking risk and volatility Aiming for high volatility and breakout players, not safe high floor guys. There are your Hunter Henrys, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not uh, Hunter Henry. Um, Renfro? Hunter Renfro, thank you. The brain does what the brain does. Um, Hunter Renfro is a pretty safe PPR guy. Now, last year, he ended up as, as a, a, a top 12 wide receiver because all the injuries around him. He's still going to be very involved in fantasy. He's going to be okay, but he is not the type of pick that is going to win you a championship. And you have to change your mentality to being okay finishing absolutely last place in your league if you want to win the championship. Get the gold. Once you win the championship, it's forever. Your name's on the plaque. Your name's on the trophy. You've gone to fantasy champs. You've gotten your belt, and you wear it every day. That's what keeps your pants up is your championship belt. Yeah, you need a belt. We have a lot of Big data. Big belt loops. <laughs> we have a lot of data. <laughs> Um, Matt DeSorbo wrote a great article about injecting volatility into your weekly lineup. Um, he also had an article, and we brought this up a little bit on the live show, talking about stacking a quarterback with a wide receiver. And it proved that, and this is, we know that that's great for best ball, but what about in our redraft leagues, our home leagues? Because those boom bust players, it seems like you're going to lose as often as you win, but that isn't actually the case. You win more than you lose with the players who have big performances and bad performances. 
on a large enough sample size, it is a mathematical advantage to have the big boom players. Here's a couple examples of where you might be in your draft around the same ADP and two different ways you could go. Quarterback. Matthew Stafford or Trey Lance? Who's safer? Stafford. Yeah. Dude just threw for 40 touchdowns, was a top 12 pick. He's got Sean McVay, but he doesn't boom. He does not go out there and rush for 80 yards, which is like throwing for 7,000, have two rushing touchdowns <laughs> and have uh, an extra passing touchdown or two. Trey Lance in the same spot has those weeks that will just crush an opponent, be a top three weekly finish, and you you get the W. At running back, you've got two guys here, David Montgomery or Travis Etienne. David, you, you say, okay, well, David Montgomery, we've seen it before. We know he's good. But the thing is, is his upside is not really something that is otherworldly with this current version of the Bears, Justin Fields, no passing weapons. He's not really a high-volume receiver. Travis Etienne is an explosive athlete. He's a first-round draft pick. He's playing with his college quarterback. We haven't seen it yet. It might feel scary to take Travis Etienne over David Montgomery. But if both of them hit their ceilings, Travis Etienne could be a superstar this year. We don't know the health of James Robinson. Okay, he's running straight lines at camp. Great. But he might be gone. Take the swing on a guy who could finish as a top 10 back. Jacoby Myers or Kadarius Toney? Jacoby's clearly been the number one in camp. He should have positive touchdown regression coming his way. But that he doesn't have the, the talent, the physical ability. When I'm talking about uh, high volatility and aiming for upside and aiming for breakout players, probably the number one thing I'm looking for is the actual athlete themselves. How young are they? How explosive are they? What can they do that other players can't do that could really propel them? You watch, you watch Kadarius Tony. He's a jitterbug out there. He's kind of Tyreek Hill-esque in the sense that he can catch the ball and make three NFL defenders just look stupid. Jacoby Myers is a good route runner, but he's not going to do that. And you you started this by saying, look, the champ of the league ends up with a crazy breakout player or two. So you're not necessarily advising, look, you, you look at every pick in your entire draft top to bottom and you're taking the riskiest player possible, like betting on 11 penny stocks to hit. You're saying don't just go mutual funds throughout your draft. Yeah, it, it's it's – it's not, yeah, I mean, it's a good point. Like, you don't want to just go nuts and say, who's the riskiest pick in every round? What you're looking for is who has an avenue for a crazy breakout. You might be on the clock, and there isn't a player there at that range that really has that. But if there is, take that guy, swing for the fences, and grab the explosive young athlete that could break out. Number six. All right, simple. We'll call this one catch and release. And it has to do with how you approach the back part of your draft. Uh, you should be focused on finding players that will reveal themselves as real or fake as quickly as possible. It is kind of a piggyback on some of Jason's points here. I am not going to spend the last two, three picks of my draft taking old veterans that have no upside, that will not reveal themselves or players with injuries, if I don't have an IR spot, that are going to sit there on my bench and in my mind during draft season, I'm going to pretend like I'm going to use them. And then one week into the year, I the reality is, is we are all looking for waiver wire opportunities in week one. So you need to draft players that you get to know, did I hit on this potential breakout ASAP? You don't clog your roster with veterans. You look for some of those upside players. Examples. At the wide receiver position, you can look at a player like Jalen Tolbert in Dallas. Is he integrated into the offense? Is this a step forward for K.J. Osborne? You might know that week one. Rondale Moore. A lot of talk in camp about being used in Arizona. You'll know it on week one. And I don't – the way you evaluate this is not necessarily that Rondale Moore goes out and has a 24-point fantasy week. It's that Ron Emil goes out there and gets a ton of snaps and is a part of the offensive game plan. This also applies to wide receiver rooms that are very murky and unknown. The Chiefs wide receivers, the Packers wide receivers. You take a late shot on somebody like a Romeo Dobbs and say, what if he hits? You know, the odds are that, you know, probably 
two out of, you know, 10 are going to be a player that surprises you with their involvement. But the point is, is you want to make a decision as fast as you can so you can move on. David Njoku, Gerald Everett at the tight end position. Raheem Mostert. Nobody really knows what his involvement's going to be in this offense. We have this, you know, Chase Edmonds looks like he's he's locked in, but is Raheem Mostert going to be a big part? Is it going to be Sonny Michelle? You know, Khalil Herbert. Is the team going to go to the map for David Montgomery again, or is Herbert going to split work with, with him? So you want to look at surprise situations with upside, not waste your picks on players that you know have a safe, comfortable floor that you really are just going to drop anyways. Yeah, I, I think the the big important part of that is the dropping part. Grab a guy that you don't care at all about kicking him to the curb so that you have the freedom to do that. Well, and, and to be to be honest, working back into the trade mentality, look, we are an emotional bunch, the fantasy community. Yes, very if, fragile. If, if you hit on one of those upside players, there's a compelling narrative for them to be involved all year, and suddenly a two-for-one happens instantaneously because you can wrap one of those. Rondale Moore blows up in week one. You you pair Rondale Moore with David Montgomery, maybe you go get a, a higher upside running back right away to start the year and cash in on that uh, promise, right? If you know Jarvis Landry has a nice week one, that's not a compelling trade chip, right? Mm -hmm. Jarvis Landry, we've been there, we've done that. So that's uh, one way to look at it. Number five. Tonight is the night we'll fight till it's over. Oh, boy. So we put our hands up like the ceiling can't hold us. Oh, boy. These three tips from us back to back to back. Well, I mean, it, they work perfectly in sync that we're all talking about the ceiling and going for it and not, not uh, trying to not lose. Try to win. When you are in your draft and when you are hitting the waiver wire, Take other people's backup running backs or perceived backup running backs. Don't take but, your but oh Mike, goodness, the voice of public opinion. But Mike, I've got Joe Mixon, and if he goes down, don't I want his backup? You would, but now you're just in a a neutral, not only a neutral situation. You're probably you've already taken a hit. Like at that point, you're. Well, gonna, yeah, I've gotten worse, haven't I? You you certainly have gotten worse. So you have bigger problems on your hands. Puberty for years for the voice of public opinion. <laughs> One of these days, I'm gonna get hair in <laughs> funny places. So, like, if after week one you have Joe Mixon and 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 something terrible unfortunately happens, and you got Chris Evans, you're like, good, I'm net, net neutral. Like, I, it, your team has not really gotten better. You've just you're trying to not lose meanwhile the team that grabbed chris evans at the back of the draft just to see what happens through the first few weeks they're all of a sudden now they have a plug and play running back to their team just got way stronger so it's it's looking at the balance of it's interesting because most people out there want to ensure their running back which ensures maybe net neutral if you're lucky right whereas you're saying if you hit on somebody else's backup, it's a net positive to your team because you're adding a hard-to-find position to an already good roster. Exactly. And look, as we get through the season, once when you're getting into the fantasy playoffs, we'll be talking about it on this podcast. Please subscribe, follow, and we will be talking about it. There is a time in the season where we start to prepare for the playoffs, and at that point, I like to put my backup running backs on my bench because they're like as you get into the playoffs – Finding a player at that caliber should something go wrong, nearly impossible. Yeah, there's risk aversion at that point. But at the beginning of the season, for the first half, you're trying to establish that your team is going to dominate and just squelch everybody in the league. It's so, also torturous when you have somebody else's backup that hits. Yes, and they don't have them. So I like, you know, and, and so Alexander Madison. No, I'm not. If I have Dalvin Cook on my team, and that's super risky because Dalvin Cook, we feel like Madison's one of the better insurance running backs in the league, but just he's not going to help you win if you have Dalvin Cook. Brooks, you have an interesting point on this that you were just sharing. Oh, yeah, it's that's uh, bitten me many times where I draft the backup to my stud running back, and then every week I'm too afraid to drop them because mm -hmm. this is the week my guy goes down, and then I will re regret it. Absolutely. And that's that's 
Thank you, Brooks. That's fear based drafting that's doesn't an, work. Another good point of now your roster is clogged. You are if you're gonna make that move, it you better be committed to that safety throughout the entire season because like the Brooks is right. What you now you can't make a waiver ad because mm. you go, Oh, what, 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 what if my running back gets hurt? This might be the week. Much so, easier to drop someone else's running back. You exactly. don't have the same fear, but also much easier to then use Andy's two for one deal making and say, oh, I was going to drop this guy anyway. Let me add him as a throw in trade piece to the Joe Mixon manager. Yes. And now you've got uh, a lot more value to your team than just your backup who yep. sits there and waits. Especially like, it, let's, uh, Joe, I, we're picking on Joe Mixon. I don't, we don't mean to do that. But like, if Joe Mixon doesn't get hurt, hurt, but gets shook, gets dinged up, leaves the game. For a couple snaps, you go to that manager like, hmm, seems like you probably should have protected yourself in that Joe Mixon pick. I've got his backup. Let's let's work out a two for one here, you know, just in case. So there's when you take other people's backup running backs, you open up a world of possibilities and upside for your team instead of just a a real safe. I'm in the far right lane and going the speed limit. Insurance policy. Exactly. Yeah, rip their throats out. Oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> okay, McGruber. Number four. Speaking of ripping <laughs> throats. That's a turkey. I call <laughs> I call this the running back rip cord. This is a Do you have a you don't have a sound effect for this one? I I don't. I I, I What? I know. I I found a, a, a rip cord quote that I couldn't quite grab from uh four Christmases, but anyways. <laughs> um great story. <laughs> So, no, no, no. I don't want to hear more about this. <laughs> okay. Well, it's Vince Vaughn. <laughs> He's in a car. Anyways, um, I have a personal reminder as a player, not as an analyst, and my Slack bot reminder set to go off after week one in the NFL. And I figured if I think this tip is good enough for myself, the Foot Clan should know about this tip, and I'm going to do that right now. Running backs who see fewer. Hold on, let me set my Slack okay, yeah, bot yeah, yeah, up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get your typing figures ready. <laughs> running backs who see fewer than 13 carries in week one tend to suck on the season. And that just point blank. And I know that sounds kind of like, well, that, that can't really be universally true. If we're talking about wanting running backs who make an impact in fantasy, in 2021, only one running back hit 1,000 yards or 10 touchdowns with fewer than 13 carries in week one. It was Ezekiel Elliott who had a, a low-volume week one and then barely got to 1,000 yards. So you could say, well, okay, that was last year. Is this, is this actually a sticky stat? Since 1999, only 12% of players with 12 carries or fewer in week one went on to hit 1,000 yards or 10 touchdowns. 44% of players with 13-plus carries hit those numbers. Since 2011, the more modern NFL, guys who see fewer than 13 carries in week one average 465 rushing yards and 3.3 rushing touchdowns all season. 70% of them score four touchdowns or fewer. The only exceptions to this, that 12.5% that do hit, they are almost always known, bona fide, superstar studs like Zeke last year. You already knew he was a great back. He ended up with slightly fewer carries than you thought in week one, and he went on to have a, a decent season. The only examples of guys who have done this the last few years, Alvin Kamara, he's done it twice. He's an efficiency king. We already knew this. This wasn't his rookie year. This is after we knew. Dalvin Cook did it and Zeke. We know that those guys are going to be fine, but everyone else, all the hopefuls, the middle-tier running backs, they don't that's, work out. That's what jumped out to me when you were making – when you were sharing that was – if I'm going into week one and I'm hopeful about kind of a more ambiguous running back Brizzle. and then they don't get that level of work, mm -hmm. that's going to put an extra <laughs> layer of maybe I cash in on that promise and somebody else takes that chance of hitting the 12% instead of me. Yeah, and so the ripcord is cut bait. Trade these guys. If they, if they don't get to that mark, trade them early. And, and on the flip side, maybe there's running backs that do get the – like Najee Harris last year. He had 16 carries, only 45 yards, had a terrible first week. It just wasn't it wasn't good for fantasy. But he hit that number, went on to have an awesome year. Elijah Mitchell surprised us with 19 carries. He he hit that 13 carry threshold, went on to be awesome. 
On the flip side, the guys who didn't, didn't. And so for this year, the backfields I'm monitoring, Kansas City. Does does Clyde get 13 carries this, this week? My biggest one, my man, my dude, Brees Hall. Brees Lightning. He's got to hit that 13 week one. I'm going to be so scared if he comes out and gets fewer than 13 carries. You got Atlanta and that backfield, Washington, Gibson, Antonio Gibson, and then the Seattle Rashad Penny, Kenneth Walker. Look at that number after week one. Bit of a barometer for the running back mm-hmm. position. Number three. All right, I don't want to get dynasty players thinking, so I've got a dynasty tip for you at number three here, and it's all about oh, cashing man. in at the running back position, which is one of the most difficult things to do emotionally in be a brave. dynasty league. Yes, but be brave. Letting go of your prize possession, your RB1. The more I think about it, the more I realize dynasty, fantasy football at the running back position is a lot like the running back position in the NFL. We always talk about the scarcity being the reason running backs go high in redraft leagues, but in dynasty leagues, shelf life, it's short. Guys not hitting their potential. It happens all of the time. We have a great article up on the website, The Life Cycle of a Dynasty Running Back by Marvin uh, Elquin, who said 68% of running back one seasons happen before age 27. So statistically, you see a sharp decline age 28 plus, you may have the best running back in all of football right now, but I promise you, you won't have that forever. Age 24, age 25, that is the all-time high value for a dynasty running back, and trading a player in dynasty a year too early is a lot better than a year too late. In fact, we've played dynasty for a really long time, and I couldn't think of a situation in our leagues or any of the ones I play in where the person trading for the top of market running back has really been happy long-term in a dynasty league. The player might be great for another year, but if you move them at their peak and you get a haul, you got value for that player. And I, you know, you have extreme examples like Todd Gurley and David Johnson who dropped off the map Mm -hmm. really fast, but you also have players like Nick Chubb and Saquon Barkley who really never hit dynasty levels that you wanted when you traded for them. Like Chubb has been good. Saquon certainly hasn't delivered on what you would have had to give up to get him a couple of years ago. So the risk is tremendous in holding these players, these running backs too long in a dynasty league. It's very rare to, to get that super perennial league winning running back. And, and the hall that you can get, Andy. I know you. You said uh, the example. You traded Todd Gurley years ago off of his when when he seemed like uh, it's hard to remember in hindsight, but he was unstoppable, the best asset in fantasy football, untouchable. Yeah, and a you lot could, of dynasty you couldn't leagues. even trade to get him because he was so good. You traded him for a younger Dalvin Cook plus a ton of picks. That turned out great. I ended up trading him for a younger later in his career for a younger running back and uh, a, a pick that became Brees Hall. So you've got guys like Jonathan Taylor right now who's 23 years old, have the next two years of dominance. And at that point when he is 25 years old and he is on top of the world and he seems untouchable, the amount that you can get in Dynasty, the pick Hall that you will get, and you'll feel bad letting him go, it's a good move. Yeah. Yeah, you have to you have to be brave, like we said. Number two. As the temptations once said. Oh boy, more lyrics. To get water from a faucet, you gotta turn it. And if you want my love, you gotta earn it. And I'm talking about targets. Targets? <laughs> Earning targets. I can't I was trying to connect the wires. Because targets, Andy. Are an okay. earned yeah, I'm with statistic. You now. Yeah. And I want to talk about targets per route run. We 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 we, we kind of introduced this uh, on our podcast. We're not saying we are the first people to come up with this metric, but just starting to utilize this metric more and more this past year. And so I want I want to bring it up again. Because the thing is you don't just luck into a hundred targets. You earn them, it's a skill, you are getting open. And the way that we look at them, you know. Targets as a raw number, okay, that's that's not bad. Target share, as most fantasy football players, you're you're pretty used to that that terminology and that statistic at that point. It's a step in the right direction, 
but it's not always apples to apples. Which is percentage of team targets. Yeah, yeah yes. So the you know the attempts, how many targets did a did a player get? That percentage. It's, but the the target share is not always apples to apples. This is a just another way, a deeper dive that you can go with the target metric. So last year, Terry McLaurin, 126 targets. Hunter Renfro, 124 targets. Okay, their raw total is very similar. Terry McLaurin, a 24% target share, 21% for Hunter Renfro. You're like, okay, well, that's that's easy. Terry McLaurin just such a better wide receiver then, right? Okay, well, now look at the targets per route run. So when, when Renfro is actually running a route, 23% of the time he got a target, which is that those are absolutely elite numbers. Those are on pace with Keenan Allen, Jalen Waddell, and McLaurin was only at 21%. So just for reference for the baseline of the metric, anything above 20% of the targets per route run, that is good for a wide receiver. 25 is great, and 30% is insane. And this won't shock you, but guys like Cooper Cup, Devontae Adams, and Antonio Brown, those are the three wide receivers that hit the 30-plus targets per route run uh, share. Like, this is why we were, this metric, why we were so into Antonio Brown in the preseason of last year into the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Like, Antonio Brown joined that team halfway through, wasn't a full-time player, but just when he was on the field, he was always getting targeted, and this felt like, this is going to translate. If Antonio Brown gets more snaps, he's going to be dominant for fantasy football. And he was. Antonio Brown was on his way to being incredible before the the shirtless gallivanting, uh, which he just <laughs> – I don't know if you caught the tweet. Oh, man. But he, uh, Antonio Brown loves him, loves me some me, as Terrell Owens once said. His that, greatest regret is he couldn't watch himself play. Yes. <laughs> Like as live, a fan, as live. a fan, live. Because when he watches the tape, it's not the same experience that the fans are getting in the uh, in the stadium. Sensational. I really relate to that. But go Sen on. Sensational tweet. Uh, but we're so this year to take this metric even further for the Foot Clan. We're going to have a weekly article highlighting these things, and I think that this is uh, a fantastic piggybacking for what we were talking about. Uh, Andy was saying, you know, these wide receivers at the end of the draft. Uh, are we? Are you going to hold on to them? Are they involved? You know, like just just the raw snaps that they're getting on the field. Okay, look at their targets per route run. Are they earning a target when they actually run a route, earning that quarterback trust, and kind of marking to us if they see an uptick in work, this player could really start to explode for fantasy football. So here's a couple of players that uh, that I want to highlight. So this past year, you had Kadarius Tony. 27% of his routes, he got a target. Like, he was outrageous. And the same with Elijah Moore, which, I mean, th these two guys are hitting so many boxes of second-year player, showed us what they could do on the field, targets per route run, like play in New York. Yeah, sort of, for a New York team yeah. that's not in New York. Uh, and one that's going to be shocking to you, Jonu Smith, mm -hmm. when he actually ran a route, 27%. The plan was Johnny. 27% of the time when he ran around, he got a target. And combine that with the news out of New England that Johnny Smith right now, it's camp, but in camp, he is, what, number two? He is a target he, he, leader. He, he was either number one or number yes. two in targets. And the reason, so they paid Johnny Smith a lot of money. He's a very good athlete and a very good player. The reason he disappointed for fantasy last year was because he was so darn good at blocking. They, they, he was a blocker. When he yeah. ran a route, he was utilized. He just, he wasn't used in that fashion a lot. And that could be the same thing that happens this year. It could. But the Patriots are installing an entirely new run scheme. I don't know why. People can't figure it out. But they are trying to put in the Shanahan uh, system at, at in the running game. And while tight ends certainly block, they can go out a little bit more from that system. We've seen that with George Kittle. And so John, who is an interesting name, obviously yes. in your home leagues, I mean, you could you could get him off the waiver wire, but right. pay attention week one. But in you know underdog, when you're drafting three three tight ends, you can get him in your last round. And then meanwhile, on the other side of the coin, you have Devin Singletary, just catastrophic. The running back for the Buffalo Bills, thirteen percent. I mean, they they targeted Chase Edmonds, pass catching running back this off season. They tried to get J D. McKissick, smooches, pass catching running back. And what they do in the draft, James Cook pass catching running back he's gonna be very good so uh, just be careful there with Devlin Singletary 
And, of course, Robbie Anderson's numbers were <clears throat> terrible as well. Either way you spell his name, bad targets per route run. But So, we, like I said, we will have a, a weekly article highlighting guys that we're looking at using this metric. Just a, just a deeper dive here for the Foot Clan. Number one. Well, what's our number one tip this year? Our number one tip, Foot Clan, be resilient. Things happen both in the draft that you don't like and in fantasy that you don't like. Breaks won't go your way always. You can lose. You could start the season off 0-1, 0-2, 0-3. Be resilient. Don't tilt. Have a plan. The plan in the draft can come from mapping it out. You know what I mean? If you're, oh, oh, gosh. Oh. The <laughs> you're a man of your words, Jason. Thank you. Should have stopped already, but no. Keep going. All right, that was the it. one. Um, that's like that's bad. Yeah, it's terrible. Uh, I just I somebody I, wrote that. That's what blows my Someone, mind. Some musician. Was, Are there lyrics on a piece of paper like no, the no, official ones? No. There I've was. Got it. There was a musician in a studio, just chiseling away on the ivory, and they're like, dum, "Yep, dum, dum, that's it. Dum, Full, dum, dum, send it in. Dum, 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 send it dum, in." Dum, dum, dum. But um, in the season, once you get going, you're you're knowing that you're going to be resilient no matter what. If you get off to a slow start and you lose a couple games, do not quit. Do not tilt. That alone, just saying, I'm sticking with it. I'm sticking with my team, my waiver pickups through it. You will be absolutely fine. Getting off to an 0-3, 0-4 start, you can come back and win it all. Yeah, we know because we have uh, thousands and thousands of teams tell us every year and over the last 10 years, they're comeback stories because they didn't hashtag fantasy freak out. Oh, nope. that's good. Fantasy freak out. And let's tie this together with Jason made a running back point just a little bit, little bit earlier in the show. Najee Harris, week one, running back 43. Someone you took in the late first, early second. It was catastrophic. It was panic in the streets. But he had 19 opportunities, and he surpassed that 13 carry threshold that Jason was talking about. And look what happened. Najee Harris, perfectly fine for fantasy football. You, we say this a lot. You don't win your fantasy championship at the draft. You can lose it at the draft, and you build a foundation. But you do not win it at the draft. So you have to be resilient. You have to stick through the whole season. I want you to get championships this year, especially those of you who haven't yet ever had one. This is your year. Just remember, if you start 0-3, 0-4, whatever has happened can happen in reverse. Yes, mm. yes, it you can. can win the next three or four games. Oh, an adage. And you're not. This isn't the NFL. It's not like you got a real locker room of guys where the momentum affects your team, right? This is players spanning every team in the NFL, and you can get a bad draw in the first few weeks. You can have players like Najee not yet ready to contribute. There's a lot that can happen, but look, we got a longer season than we've ever had, right? We have 17 weeks um, in the NFL now, so uh, hang in there. It'll just make the victory that much more sweet. That is going to do it for today's episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Do us a favor. Click that subscribe button. Click that follow button. Stay with us this year. New episodes every day. It's going to be fun. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.